Okay, so over the next 55 minutes, what I'm going to try and do is talk about some of the work that we've been doing um, over probably, well, I've been working in this field for about 25 years, but I'll talk about some of our more recent work and, and, and sort of how we've tried to understand the really complex phenomenon that is suicide and suicidal behavior. And the stark reality that every year globally, um, about 800,000 people um, lose their struggle to live and countless more than that. It, uh, literally every day we think there are maybe 10 times that number who, are at, who attempt suicide. So really it's a huge public health uh, priority and, and indeed suicide is a leading killer of men under 50 in our country. So it's really important that we tackle and try and understand it. It's what I'll try, I will do, if I can get my thing to move, yeah. In terms of outline is, I'll, I'll say a bit about the background to the complexity of suicide, and then I'll focus in on the IMV model. So the integrated motivational volitional model that I've developed, and, and then talk about some of the research that we and others have done to try and understand uh, the core concepts. And you'll see there's three parts to the talk. The first bit is a sort of description of the key components of the model. And the second bit, is looking at one of, what I see as one of the key challenges in the field, which is lots of people have thoughts of suicide, transition from thinking about suicide to attempting suicide. And our best estimate is it's about, a, it's about a third of people make that transition. And so that second bit, we'll be trying to focus in on what are the key factors we think help us understand who is more vulnerable, who is more likely to act on their thoughts of suicide. And then the third bit I'll talk about is some recent research we've been doing, given um, obviously COVID-19. At the start of the pandemic, we uh, launched a large scale study across the UK to try and track people's mental health. I'll report what are our key findings from the initial phase of lockdown, which actually got some media coverage over the last um, couple of weeks. So that's a broad context. So we just jump in straight into the complexity. Now this is a, a model, a, a biopsychosocial framework or model that uh, we published last year and was led by Gustavo Tarecki, a psychiatrist, his work in, in uh, McGill in, in Montreal. But what I really want to highlight here is really rec the recognition that if we're to understand suicidal risk, we have to appreciate that suicide, although often when we media, I think it's often covered in a very reductionistic way that there's one reason why people kill themselves, and that often is people kill themselves because they're depressed. And indeed, although depression is an important part of the puzzle that leads to suicide, uh, depression is not the reason people die by suicide. And indeed, it's estimated that of those people who are treated for depression, less than 5% of people who are treated for depression actually end their life. So what, we're, so what I mean, that recognizes is that yes, suicide in Western countries usually occurs in the context of the mental health problem, but mental health problems are, are not a sufficient cause or sufficient explanation. And as you can see here from, from the figure, we, if we're looking at suicide risk, we have to look at early life adversity, and I'll come back to that later in the talk, early life trauma and how that can influence our well-being and our vulnerability. Um, but then look more broadly at these sort of developmental factors. We've done a lot of work on some personality factors. So for example, there's a, we've done a lot of work on this idea of a particular type of, of perfectionism called socially prescribed perfectionism is associated with increased vulnerability to suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts. And what socially prescribed perfectionism is, is some of us, and I'm one of them, has really high levels and was really concerned about the expectations of others around us. And that, and that those expectations that every day is an opportunity for repeated failure and every day is an opportunity for us to think that we fail to meet other people's expectations of us, which we then internalize as self-criticism and we're caught in this sort of negative cycle of negative thoughts about ourselves and the world and the future. But what I really want to focus in on is the recognition. You can see psychopathology here is, here is what I've mentioned in terms of recognizing that there is obviously a mental health context in terms of mental ill health. But what I'm really gonna focus in on today is really what I see as more proximal psychological factors. So one of my key take home messages from tonight will be, 
that although suicide and to understand suicide risk, we have to recognize the complexity, the biological complexity, the social context, uh, the psychological context. I would argue that suicide is ultimately a psychological phenomenon because for basically in, in, in terms of the globally, 800,000 people each year who, who, who die by suicide, basically that that perfect storm of factors comes together such that an individual views their future as so bleak that they see suicide as the ultimate solution to their mental pain and that they feel that they're, they're trapped in this sense of mental pain. So I'm really going to focus in on the psychology because I think it's ultimately a psychological phenomenon affected by all these different complex factors and indeed that's where it led my thinking when I developed the integrated motivational volitional model. So that's the broad context. And so as I say, I've been working in this field since the 1990s. And, and then about maybe about 10 or 15 years into my journey, my suicide research journey, um, in 2011, I published uh, the integrated motivational volitional model. Now, uh, it was published first of all in 2011, and then with my colleague, Olivia Kirkley, we updated it and refined it a little in 2018. And it's a 2018 paper that you, you see here. But I suppose it was my attempt at the time to bring together the different theoretical perspectives because other people had been trying to piece together over many years in a sort of framework uh, to understand the psychological, the social, the biological, clinical and cultural influences in suicide. And the IMV model in 2011 was my attempt to do so. So what I'm going to do now is just give a brief overview of the key components of the model and then move on to some of the research that we've been doing over the last number of years with my colleagues at the Suicidal Behaviour Research Laboratory and then nationally and internationally to try and address some of the key questions that um, arise from the model, but crucially to help us better understand who's most vulnerable, because if we can understand who, why and when people are most vulnerable, then we can develop interventions to hopefully prevent suicide. So this is the IMV model, so the Integrated Motivational Volitional Model, and so there's a bit of a mouthful, so we just go for the IMV for short. As you can see here, it's in, it's in three parts. So on the left-hand side here, we've got um, the pre-motivational phase. And that left-hand bit is like the sort of the background context in which suicidal thoughts and behavior may emerge. So first of all, we've got there, we've got diathesis, which is just another word for vulnerability factor. And, and those vulnerability factors can come in many different forms. So some of those Vulnerability factors can be biological. So, for example, we know that uh, there's low levels of serotonin and its metabolites um, are, and transporters are associated with vulnerability to suicide. Now, they're also associated with a whole range of other issues and problems, but it's just one particular vulnerability. Or you could have a personality type vulnerability factor. And I mentioned one already, this idea of socially prescribed perfectionism. But in the second bit of the pre-motivational phases, environmental influences. And the stark reality is that people who die by suicide, although suicide effects are, can affect people across the socioeconomic spectrum, it disproportionately affects people at, who are towards the lower end of the, the, of the socioeconomic spectrum. And indeed in Scotland, we know that depending on which statistics you look like, the, rate, the, the risk of suicide in, in basically the most affluent areas compared to the most dis disadvantaged areas, it depends on different ways you can do the analysis, but it's at least two to three fold, right up to 10 fold differences, obviously being much more common in the, most, in the most disadvantaged areas. And then the last bit is negative life events. We know that people who attempt suicide or die by suicide experience a disproportionate number of negative life events. And I'll return to stress and negative life events later in the talk. But I think for the purpose of of tonight, I'm going to focus in on the key, I think, is the key components of the model. So in a very parsimonious way, the second bit of the model, or the motivational phase, is trying to understand the emergence of suicidal thinking, or the emergence of suicidal ideation. And then in, in, in a very straightforward way, the argument is that suicidal thoughts emerge in situations in which people feel either defeated and or humiliated 
from which they cannot escape. And ultimately the key driver to suicide risk is this sense of entrapment. And it's your, this entrapment is this mental pain that an individual feels they cannot escape from. So it's a contemporaneous uh, experience of both defeat and, humi hum and humiliation from which you cannot escape. Now, other things like shame and loss and other sort of negative emotions can feed into that sense of defeat and humiliation, but it's that ultimately the key driver is that sense of entrapment. So that's in a very parsimonious way. There's a range of other psychological factors here, which are all implicated in, as we move from defeat through to entrapment, through to suicidal ideation. But again, if you're interested to learn more about the model, if you go to our website, uh, suicideresearch.info, there's much more detail on the IMD model, including a range of sort of videos and podcasts and other resources, which explain in more detail some of the other factors. And then the third bit of the model is comes back to this issue I mentioned at, at the start of the talk. This idea that we know that lots of people experience suicidal thoughts, but thankfully the majority of people don't make that transition, don't cross the precipice from thinking about suicide to attempting suicide. And so according to the model, this third phase, the volitional phase is key. It's key to understanding that transition, or we would describe it in psychological terms as the sort of behavioral inaction. So that it's going from thoughts to acts of suicide. And so according to the model, when I updated the model with Olivia in 2018, we define this phase in much more detail. But and I'll come back to this, this transition in, in the second part of my talk. But really, there are eight, as you'll see, eight key, what I describe as volitional factors or volitional moderators, the presence of which increases the likelihood we move from thinking about suicide to attempting suicide. But I'll come back to that. So what I want to focus in on now for a second is some of the data that we have in really understanding this sort of central portion, looking at defeat and entrapment and so on. So the key message here is entrapment is central to the sort of suicidal process and we need to um, maybe, maybe understand it better. So, and so basically we've done lots of different studies um, looking at different aspects of the psychology of suicide, different aspects of um, these sort of entrapment processes and defeat and humiliation and so on. But what I want to focus in on is one study, which is front and center here, which is this four year study we did with colleagues in Edinburgh and in uh, Nottingham and Oxford, in which we tracked what we often do in some of our clinical studies is we try and track people over time and try to, to determine whether some of the factors we think are important in predicting suicidal behavior over time, we try and investigate, are they actually important? Because if we can demonstrate that they are important, then that says to us, we need to try and intervene and target that particular factor. And this study is focusing, as you'll see, in on entrapment. So in this study, people in, this is in, conducted in Edinburgh, people who pre presented to hospital following a suicide attempt, one of my team will have assessed them on a whole range of psychological measures and clinical measures, including depression, entrapment, and so on. And then over time, we're able to confidentially and anonymously track individual, individuals over the next four years to see whether individuals attempted suicide or sadly died by suicide. Because what we're trying to, to establish was, if my model is correct, entrapment should be really important in predicting those individuals who attempt suicide. So this is just our key findings in this study. This is this graph just represents those individuals in green who over the next four years never attempted suicide again um, or never died by suicide. And the repeat group are individuals who sadly were hospitalized again. And what this graph just illustrates on, on the horizontal axis in each of these factors that people when we saw them in hospital, who were more suicidal, who were more depressed, who were more de hopeless, defeat, de defeated and entrapped. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, they all predicted statistically predicted the um, increased likelihood of attempting suicide in the next four years again. But what was important though was when we asked which of those factors is most important, we found two factors emerged. First was past behavior. So the single best predictor of whether somebody attempts suicide in the future is whether they've attempted suicide in the past. It's exactly the same as any other behavior. So that's exactly what we found here. But I can't change somebody's past, of course. 
And then the only other factor which emerged was his entrapment. So how, when, when we assess levels of entrapment in the hospital, remember this is usually within 24 hours of a suicide attempt, those levels of people, what people told us in terms of levels of entrapment predicted repeat suicidal behavior over time. So the take home message from this study and the countless other studies that we and others have been involved in is, is that working with somebody clinically, we need to be trying to target this sense of entrapment because entrapment is the, is the sort of pernicious psychological factor, which is maybe driving the suicidal thoughts that we're trying to reduce. These are just some other data um, from other studies which tell the same story. But what I want to just draw your attention to here are, so don't worry about the statistics, is one of the things about the model, the model argues is that people who are feeling defeated, it's the, the thing which is dangerous is if you feel defeated and then you're trapped, and then it's the entrapment that leads you to becoming suicidal. So we would describe that obviously as a mediating pathway. So entrapment is a mediator or the bridge between defeat and suicidal thinking emerged. And we find this in this top one, uh, Karen Wellerall from my, my lab. So Karen, this is data from um, university students. And then the figure below is um, Rebecca Owen and colleagues at Manchester University. And this is a group of, of patients with bipolar disorder. But the key message here is you still see the same pattern, defeat to entrapment and entrapment to suicidal thinking. So really highlighting the importance of entrapment. And then to bring it th th this closer to home, a few years ago, we conducted the Scottish Wellbeing Study. And the Scottish Wellbeing Study is this longitudinal study, as you can see here, of a nationally representative sample of young adults. And, they, and these are some data we just it, um, under revision with a journal at the minute, which we looked at, could we predict suicidal thinking over 12 months? And, and uh, basically, as you can see here, we had three, three and a half thousand people at baseline. And then 12 months later, we got a, a good follow-up of about 71% of the sample. Now, all the, the, the sensitive questions around suicidal thoughts and so on were all completed on the computer. So we've got confidence in terms of the people's answers to these. But again, in terms of the model, key factors, if we're looking to see what predicts suicidal thinking over time, what we can see here are, so again, forget about the, the statistics, but the key messages are in bold. So when we look at see what predicted suicidal thinking at 12 months, so 12 months after seeing us for the first time. So unsurprisingly, how suicidal somebody was when we saw them at baseline was a significant predictor of how suicidal they were 12 months later. So that's no surprise. It's again, the same idea that the best predictor of future suicidal thinking is your past suicidal thinking. But again, when we do this multivariate analysis, two other factors emerge. One is um, an aspect of entrapment called internal entrapment and perceived burdensomeness. And again, these are burdensomeness is also in the IMV model. It draws on work that Thomas Joyner, another psychologist in the United States, talks about in his own model of suicide, the uh, interpersonal theory. But what I want to just highlight here is this sense of internal entrapment. And there's lots of studies now which show that internal entrapment is much more dangerous for your mental health than external entrapment. So the question is, well, what is in internal and what is? So internal entrapment is this sort of mental pain, these thoughts of people who are suicidal often grapple with, which is I'm worthless. I'm a burden on others. People will be better off and that life is not going to get better. That cycl cyclical then you just can't stop. And that's much more dangerous, we think, than external entrapment. And my internet is saying, internet is unstable, so I'm hoping you can still hear me. Um, external entrapment, external entrapment is when you're trapped effectively by life circumstances. And indeed it could be that you're, you've lost your job and you don't see any prospect of getting another job or your relationship is broken down and you don't feel that you'll find love again or whatever it may be. So again, the key message here is, when we're trying to predict suicidal thinking over time, entrapment is key, burdensomeness are key. And this is over and above when we, because although depression is important in the sort of background, in the mix of understanding suicidal risk, in statistical terms, it's not a, a specific enough marker of risk. Okay, so that's, so lots of sort of data um, on different studies with different populations, clinical populations and non-clinical populations.
in which we try and understand suicidal risk. And these are just the last slide, again, drawing from the, the Scottish wellbeing study, where we see, we see the same pathway which I mentioned earlier, defeat to entrapment to suicidal thinking. So I think that hopefully will give you some um, the fact that the core, the central, but the motivational phase of the IMV model is, I mean, there's empirical data to support it and the, the central importance of entrapment. The obvious question is, well, how do you assess entrapment? I've talked about what internal is. I've talked about what external entrapment is. Now, when we assess entrapment, we normally use a 16-item 16, 16 scale, which was developed by clinical psychologist Paul Gilbert and his colleague Stephen Allen. And, and that's all well and good, and it's, a, it's really common from external entrapment, and the data I've just talked about all use that measure. But if you're going to work clinically with somebody who's in front of you and you're concerned about and you're trying to see how trapped they are, we really, 16 items isn't, isn't particularly helpful. We need a briefer measure. So what we did, this was with work at Derek de Burr in the Netherlands and other colleagues, and what we basically did was we, we developed a four item version of entrapment, the, the short form, the entrapment short form scale effectively. But what's really interesting is, even if you just use the four 16 items, the correlations are really, really close. So this correlation here of 0.94 in the a clinical sample, so it's a clinical sample of almost 500 people who'd self-harmed. So, and so that 0.9 correlation is a correlation between the brief four item version and the 16 item version. So really we're losing very little explanatory power if we use the four item version. So then the questions are, but what are, the, are, what are those four items? Again, for those of interest, here are the four items. So, there, so again, so I often have the feeling that I would just like to run away or I feel trapped inside myself and I feel I'm in a deep hole I can't get out of. So those are the four questions which are tapping um, entrapment in, the, in, our, in our scale. And we're hoping then with, we just publish this short version of it, that it will hopefully increase the likelihood or extend the likelihood that will be used in clinical context as well as in, in other research studies. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the sort of the, the motivational phase of the model. So the defeat and entrapment and so on. So what I want to do now is return to the I posed at the start. This challenge that of those people who think about suicide, about a third will make the transition from thinking to attempting suicide. And crucially, if, if we have a loved one or a family member or a friend who's having suicidal thoughts, we're trying to, it's obviously frightening, um, but you're trying to then ascertain who is more likely to act on their thoughts. And it's really important to state that sadly, although there have been huge advances in our, our understanding of suicide, our ability to predict suicide is still no better than chance. Now that is in part to do with the fact that although every single suicide is attracted suicides globally each year, 6,000 in the UK, 7,800 in Scotland, that statistically there, there are rare events. And statistically, in, in terms of rates per 100,000, there's about 10 people in every 100,000 people will end their lives in the UK. So you're trying to, uh, basically, not only are you trying to identify the 10 people out of the 100,000 who are at risk, but as one of the founding sort of fathers of su modern suicide research, Edwin Schneidman talked about, you're trying to predict death day. Not only are you trying to predict the person who's most likely to die, you're trying to be most likely to die. So it's really, really challenging. But in our attempts to understand and move and improve our understanding, theoretical models like mine and others, we hope will help us move forward in that, in that really important challenging task. So what this is, this slide is, if you think back to my model many slides ago, the right-hand bit of the model the right hand bit of the model was the volitional phase, was called the volitional phase. And what I've simply done here is blown up the, the volitional phase so we can see the eight key factors. As you can see, there are eight factors. The argument is that the presence, if somebody's feeling suicidal, having suicidal thoughts, that the, the transition from think from thoughts of suicide to a suicide attempt, so going from the blue through to the sort of peach color, is increased the more of these middle phase factors, the more of these volitional factors you have. 
So we'll talk us through a few of these and then I'll, I'll return the same idea with some data. So, so in many respects, like some of these are, are not that surprising in that they make sort of common, the common sense. But what I try to do is put them in a framework which helps us understand who might be more vulnerable. And again, we can then target interventions along some of these, these eight volitional factors. Because these are the key. So these eight factors, I would argue, are the key factors which govern the transition from thinking to attempting suicide. So the first then, again, no surprise. If I am thinking of, if I have thoughts of suicide, I'm much more likely to make the transition from thinking to acting on those thoughts if I could access the means of suicide. And indeed, if we look at the public health interventions, so the, the, the most robust evidence we have globally for what works to prevent suicide is restricting access. And restricting access can be, so if you think back 20 years ago in the UK, in 1998, more than 20 years ago, in 1998, uh, the legislation was changed such that you couldn't buy paracetamol or other analgesics um, you could only buy them, sorry, in, in blister packs of 16. That's when that was introduced. And you could only buy two packets without seeing a pharmacist. And that's legislation now. And that changed from being able to buy countless tablets and paracetamols in jars, um, or whatever, whatever you hold um, lots of tablets in. And um, that change to blister packs has been shown to reduce the number of suicides. So that huge aura, things we do in terms of access to areas of concern, adding catalytic converters to cars, reduce suicide risk. There's a whole, there's a number of them. So access, restricting access to means is really important. Second, basically the extent to which somebody has actually formulated a plan, how and when and they're going to actually attempt suicide um, increases, unsurprisingly, increases the likelihood that somebody acts on their thoughts. And indeed, we've done some basic, some brief interventions-based work looking at how we can do uh, work with safety plans and other types of psychological interventions to which target that planning phase to hopefully interrupt the suicidal thoughts so they don't go from thoughts to acts of suicide. Third, exposure to suicide or suicidal behavior. So that's knowing somebody else, somebody close to you who's attempted suicide or died by suicide. Your statistical risk is increased if you've lost a loved one to suicide. And I have somebody who's sadly lost two people in my life to suicide. I'm high up on this in terms of a risk, another risk factor that I have. Now, it's really important to highlight that although that's a statistical risk factor, uh, the overwhelming majority of people who have been bereaved by suicide or lost a close friend to suicide they'll never become suicidal, will never attempt suicide, will never die by suicide, but it is a risk factor. Next, impulsivity. Again, no surprises perhaps. Thoughts of suicide, impulsive, much more likely to act on your thoughts. And then our, our physical pain sensitivity or tolerance and fearlessness about dying, they're comprised of what, what Thomas Joyner, who I mentioned already, talks about is having the capability for suicide. For you to act on your thoughts of suicide, for many people, you have to overcome the, the fear of dying. You have to overcome, you become fearless about dying. We know that fearlessness about dying comes and goes, it waxes and wanes. And with higher levels of fearlessness are much more likely to act on their thoughts. Physical pain tolerance are also more likely to act on their thoughts. And indeed, mental work on these aspects. And then the second last one is mental imagery. That if people who have actually pictured themselves dying or dead are much more likely to act on their thoughts. And then the last one, as again, I mentioned a few slides ago, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So again, if your thoughts of suicide and you've previously attempted suicide, you're much more likely to act on your thoughts. So according to the model, according to my model, these eight pillars of behavioral inaction, they're the key to understand this transition from thinking about suicide to attempting suicide. So what I want to do now is show you some data we've, we've got from the Scottish Wellbeing Study, again, which I mentioned earlier. Scottish Wellbeing Study is identifies, you can see here, our, our respondents into three groups. 
people who'd never been suicidal, people who'd thought about suicide, but had never acted in their thoughts, and then those individuals who'd actually attempted suicide. And what we can, what we can simply do then is if according to my model, according to my model, if, if I was to just focus in on the people who think about suicide, so the ideation group, and compare them to those who've attempted suicide, so they shouldn't differ on my motivational factors like defeat and entrapment. They should differ on the volitional factors like impulsivity and exposure and so on. Because remember, the volitional phase, the volitional factors are key to behavioral inaction, key to this differentiation between thinking about suicide to attempting suicide. So in the next slide, I'm just literally going to focus in on the ideation group and the attempt group and literally go through each of the variables just very quickly and you'll hopefully be able to detect a pattern which is consistent with my model. Factors on the left hand side. So first of all, just to highlight that unsurprisingly, the people who attempted suicide are significantly older and significantly more likely to be female. So although suicide tends to be characterized as a male phenomenon, because three quarters of all suicides are by men, non-fatal suicidal behavior tends to be much more, is much more likely to be female. So they, there's no surprises here. But crucially though, it's, there's no difference in depressive symptoms when you do these multivariate analysis. So it's not that the people who are more likely to act on their thoughts, that's not explaining the difference between thoughts the ideation group and the attempts group. And then what we've got here are these are factors all driven or derived from the middle portion of my model, my model. And so they're all important in the suicidal process, but my argument is they're not important in understanding the distinction between thoughts and attempts. And indeed that's what you find. When you do the statistical analysis, there's no difference between those groups. However, Remember, the model says that volitional, factor, volitional phase factors are where differentiation is. And that's exactly what you find. The people that attempt at suicide are significantly more hope, are significantly more impulsive. They have significantly higher levels of this capability for suicide. This is measure of fearlessness and physical pain tolerance. Significantly higher levels of this mental imagery around dying and death significantly more likely to know a friend who's attempted suicide than those who just thought about suicide. But surprisingly, there was no difference. And we thought there might be a difference between the exposure to having a family member who's died by, or who's attempted suicide, or a family member who's died by suicide. And the reason we think there was no difference here is because this is a, a young adult population. Remember, it's 18 to 34 year olds. And because and I think in that age group, you're much more influenced by your peers rather than your family. But we need to replicate this. But the key take home message from this slide, um, and again, all the papers, all the published papers here, are if you're interested to, to know more, are all available on our website, suicideresearch.info. So, but the key take home message is the volitional phase factors in thinking about suicide and attempting suicide. These are data I've just shown from Scotland. We see exactly the same pattern of findings with data that Katie Dingra collected in England. Don't worry about the details, just trust me. We find exactly the same with English um, students. We also find exactly the same when we look at adolescent self-harm, but there's not explicitly suicidal intent. We see very similar findings there. Again, that's a large-scale sample of, as you can see, almost over 5,000 kids, young people from in Ireland these data were from. So again, really convincing, I think, of the importance of these volitional phase factors. And then more recently still, with work led by Becky Mars at Bristol, again, this is part of this big, this what's known as the ALSPAC cohort study, this Avon and Somerset um, birth cohort study, in which people have been followed, families have been followed since birth over time. And what They've got some factors which are pertinent to the IMV model, but what we can, in this longitudinal study, we, we, we've been able to show is that this idea of exposure or other or past self-harming behavior are key predictors to future suicide attempts amongst adolescents. Okay, so that's the sort of the, the all I want to say about these sorts of studies. So try to, thus far, if you try and recap, 
So what I'm trying to highlight thus far is the importance of this, the factors that lead to the emergence of suicidal thinking. And then this bit is really focusing in on our sort of epidemiological research, in which we're trying to understand this transition from thinking to attempting suicide. But what I want to move on to now is something very, very different than some of the experimental based work. I said at the very start, if we look at the model on the left hand side of the model, uh, in the pre motivational phase, we obviously had negative life events and stress. And, and one of the things we know for certain is that people who attempt suicide, people who die by suicide over the course of their lifespan, both in early childhood as well as throughout adulthood, they tend to experience significantly more negative life events. And, that, and remember, if you experience negative life events, we need cortisol, the stress hormone, to be released. And so we need cortisol as the fight or flight hormone. We need cortisol to prepare us to deal with what life's throwing up at us. People um, are experiencing more negative life events, so their cortisol system is repeatedly, or their stress system, the HPA axis, is being repeatedly activated. And one of the things I'll show you in this experimental study that we did was keeping with this idea of trying to understand the difference between people who think about suicide and those who attempt suicide. What we were interested in here was saying, well, actually, I wonder, can, is cortisol, the psychophysiology, different? And, is there, and can we better understand um, the difference between thinking about suicide and attempting suicide in terms of cortisol? And our hypothesis, as I'll explain in a second, is this idea that because the stress system has been repeatedly pummeled effectively, um, that basically it becomes dysregulated. It, it stops working as effectively and, and it becomes what is often described as a blunted cortisol response. So when we encounter a stressful life event, we want cortisol to be released. So it's this nice release and then it, it decreases. So you, you, but when it, the cortisol system isn't working as well, you often see this flatter response. And it's that flatter response or the blunted response, which is problematic because it's not preparing the body effectively to deal with the threats in the environment. And we also know that cortisol is implicated in decision-making, cortisol is implicated in problem solving, cortisol is implicated in emotion regulation. Three things which are also implicated in the decision, sadly, to attempt suicide or die by suicide. So this is work um, that I've been doing in collaboration with, I have an identical twin brother, um, as you do. Uh, so Daryl, who's a, a professor of health psychology or professor of psychology at Leeds University. And Daryl's a stress researcher. So this is work I've done in collaboration uh, with him. And we, we've worked together for quite a while. And I always, I love this slide. I don't really care if you don't, <laughs> I think it's amusing. So this is our collaboration then and that's, us as, as, as Wayans, as Wayans, and then obviously us more recently um, in our continued collaboration. Okay, so getting back to the sort of nitty gritty of the presentation. So it's this experimental study and we're looking what's known as cortisol reactivity. So cortisol reactivity in the laboratory setting is what we do is we bring people into the lab and there's different experimental ways in which we can induce stress in the body. And one of those ways is what's known as uh, called the Maastricht Acute Stress Test, or the MAST. And the Maastricht Acute Stress Test, another mouthful, is this combination of getting people to put their hands in cold water whilst having to do this pretty complicated, something like start at 1,117, and you have to count back in 13s, I think it's the task. And if you, and you think you're being video recorded, and if you get it wrong, you have to go back to the beginning. So it's pretty stressful. And, um, and, and it's worth noting this is completely informed consent. Obviously people are told of the nature of the task in advance, and there's no adverse effects. But what we do know is doing those, those combination of tasks, the water task and the arithmetic task, activates the stress system, activates the HPA axis, and we can then assess cortisol. And how we assess cortisol is in our saliva. So we give people swabs and, and we can then, as you'll see in a second, assess cortisol over the duration of the study. So if we look at the study design, this is a, a say, very different one. This we're bringing people into the lab, this time with, a different, with, with people with different suicidal histories. So we've got individuals here with no suicidal history at all. 
Then we've got people who think about suicide but haven't acted in their thoughts, and then people who've attempted suicide. So again, our key thing here is we're trying to look at, in an analog sort of way, trying to understand the mechanisms, what's associated with the risk of a suicide attempt in this laboratory setting. So we can then hopefully, it helps us understand more generally what might be going on in the real world when people are navigating the challenges, the everyday challenges that they face. If we look at the sort of study design, basically we do a sort of baseline assessment here, as you can see. And then over time then, or, or sorry, baseline uh, assessment of cortisol. So again, in the swab, and then this is the mass task. So this is when we do the stress induction. So we're looking for the cortisol levels to increase. And then we, we basically then, over the period of the study, we then assess the cortisol. So what we're looking for here is when we look at the cortisol response, we're looking for this increase. So this increase in cortisol being released at the time of the stressor. But our hypothesis is that the people who have attempted suicide would release the least cortisol because their, their stress system isn't working as well as, as, as the other groups. And that's exactly what we find. So here, oh, oh, the slide's gone. Oh, you have to take my word for it. So there's, a, there's a missing slide. So basically what, what the slide was going to show was this lovely graph, um, which has basically, we, when you look at the cortisol response, the people who've attempted suicide release release the least cortisol. So they have this blunted response. The people who've only thought about suicide have got a mid-level amount of cortisol released. And then the people who have no suicidal history, they release the most. So there's good evidence then for cortisol being important, being dysregulated in individuals who have attempted suicide. So then what we also done, did in that study was, in addition to understanding this difference between people who attempted suicide and people who just thought about suicide, we want to say, well, actually, what might explain the, the obviously this flattened or this blunted cortisol response? And we look to childhood trauma, which again, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, because we know childhood trauma is associated with a whole range of mental health problems. Now, bear in mind, what the question we're asking here was, the average age of our sample here is about the average age of the people who come into our lab. And we're asking the experiences they've experienced in childhood. So that could be anything up to the age of 16. what they tell us in terms of traumatic events that they experienced in childhood ago, does it predict how much cortisol they release in the lab today? Now, before I show that, that slide, just to illustrate how in people who attempt suicide and think about suicide, that sadly trauma is so often part of the story, part of the background. So all I want you to take from this, if we look at the black bars, the, the black columns, are individuals who, the people who've attempted suicide. And what they illustrate, it doesn't matter which indicator of abuse that one uses, that the, suicide, the people who've attempted suicide are much, much higher. And indeed, 80% of the people reported at least some levels of childhood trauma. Now, the next slide is this trying to then relate the amount of trauma people have experienced to the cortisol they release. It's so what we're able to do is group our participants into those who'd experienced no trauma, those who'd experienced moderate levels, and those who'd experienced higher levels of trauma or exposed to it. And so this is, this is like the figure you would have seen in the previous slide. It's disappeared. But what we've got here on, the, on this y-axis, on the, on the vertical axis, are people's levels of, of, of cortisol. And this peak, as you can see here, this is when we do the stress induction and you can see it increasing. But what I want to just illustrate is draw your attention to this line. And this line here represents those individuals who had reported high levels of childhood exposure to trauma. And they're reporting the flattest response, the flattest response to cortisol after you control for all the standard things that you control for. Okay, so that's about the IMV for a second. So what I've tried to do, that's the end of the, the 
second bit of the talk. And in the last 10 minutes, because we started a bit late, I'm going to move on to the COVID stuff that we've been doing. But again, just to recap, so the key message then in this bit of the talk is not that if we're trying to understand the transition from thinking about suicide to attempting suicide, we've got these volitional phase factors which are important. And we've also got these psychophysiological markers here. There's evidence that perhaps this dysregulation of the cortisol now, in this study design, we can't determine cause and effect. And what we need to do is really do a longitudinal study, a real longitudinal study, to look at how your cortisol levels change in, in and how it relates to your suicidal history and deprivation and a range of other variables. Okay, so in the last bit of, of the talk, I want to, talk, want to just move on to COVID-19, given obviously it is, it is affected all of our lives in ways that we could never have envisaged um, seven months ago. And so seven months ago, um, all from colleagues at the uh, me uh, mental health research charity called MQ Research, and basically they were keen, they're the only dedicated mental health research charity in the UK, and they're really keen that we try to do something to really and anticipating what the mental health consequences would be for people to really, uh, for us to try and set priorities. So this first, this paper then, so basically with in conjunction then with MQ and then the Academy of Medical, Medical Sciences got involved and then my colleague Emily Holmes and I together with Bullmore, two psychiatrists, basically we, we all joined forces with this other group of people to put together these key priorities, mental health, research priorities in the light of COVID-19. And, and, and in terms of setting those priorities, one of the things we already had to do was, was monitor people's mental health, right? So what we're, and what we're what I'm going to pre present now is one of the things that I did, all right, led on, was trying to set up this cohort of individuals across the UK so we could monitor people's levels of anxiety, people's levels of thoughts, levels of entrapment, and so on. And so very quickly at, at, at the end of March, then I was able to convene and secure funding from some Ardens, Scottish Association of Mental Health, and Mindstep, which is another uh, charity, uh, to put together and set up the UK COVID-19 Mental Health and Wellbeing Study. And you can see my collaborators. Quickly um, monitor people's and represent a sample as far as we could do in that way, people's mental health and well-being over, over the, well, initially over the first six months of the pandemic. We've just finished wave six data collection this week for, for how people see, uh, assessing people's mental health. But what I'm going to focus in on in a second is what we found in the first six weeks of lockdown. So this is the focus just from the period, by the time we got ethics in place or ethical approval in place, we were able to go to the field to recruit our national sample Starting on the end, so it's national UK sample, and then and then these data cover people's mental health and well-being up until, as you can see here, the 11th of May. So this just giving it so representative of the UK population. So about 10% of the samples in Scotland uh, and the study, and then it's broadly representative, as you can see, outlined across the four nations of the United Kingdom. So what I'm going to focus in on is just really if this is our um, timeline for sort of policy related events um, pertinent to COVID. So I'm just focusing in when we're really in the midst of, of lockdown. 13th of May, there was some easing of restrictions and obviously it was different for us in Scotland, but that's really this period here when we really were in the depths of lockdown. And we've got, I'm gonna talk about three waves of data collection as you can see here. Um, and we've got really, really successful in recruiting people over or keeping people in the sample. And we also, in addition to this UK sample, the Scottish government have also funded us to recruit a second sample, um, a Scottish only sample, which is another two and a half thousand people. So, so these are just our broad characteristics of our samples. And I'm just focusing in on in our, broad, in our UK sample. So the question is, what do we find? So it's, before I say what we find, so when they say that we can't say anything about people's mental health beforehand because we first came, went to the field, we recruited our sample after lockdown. So what I'm, what I'm interested in is people's trajectories 
in those six weeks? Did their mental health get worse or better in those six weeks of lockdown? So what we found though is um, unsurprisingly and was reported by other, some of the other studies internationally is after a peak, initially people really, we, we were all really anxious, had no idea what was going to happen. You see this stark decrease in anxiety, symptoms of anxiety. These are all just symptoms, not diagnoses over the first three or six weeks. But you see a different pattern with depressive symptoms, which are quite flat. So people's symptoms of depression were pretty stable over those first six weeks. There was a slight decrease, but not significant. If you look at other factors we've been talking today about defeating entrapment, also of interest, you see this decreasing over time. Still, these, these levels are all still really, really high, at least double what you would expect in non-COVID times. But you can see this decrease um, in defeat. We also looked at um, people's, asked people about their self-harm and suicide attempts. Now these numbers are so small, so it's not, we can't do any formal analyses, but what's just worth noting is that there seems to be potentially some evidence of increase in self-harm and suicide attempts in those six weeks. And it's also really important to highlight, especially in the context I'm gonna talk for the remainder of the, the, the presentation, the last five minutes of the presentation about suicidal thoughts. There's no evidence at all that suicide rates have gone up yet. Although we are concerned, looking more longer term at the sort of consequences of the economic sort of loss of jobs and so on. So what but what is stark and concerning is suicidal thoughts are seem to be increasing. So although most people these are percentages, so thankfully most people don't haven't thought about suicide in the past week when we asked this question. But you see this increase; it's about ten percent of people who are thinking about suicide at, 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 by the sixth week six of the pandemic. So what's, but what's a highlight here is bearing in mind that levels of anxiety are decreasing, depression is relatively stable, the people's suicidal thoughts seem to be increasing. We think that might be because that's tapping into the uncertainty and the fear in terms of jobs and opportunities and the future, which, um, which isn't tapped by traditional measures of depression or depressive symptoms and symptoms of anxiety. Just sort of if I just hone in then on some age groups. Again, this has been widely reported in the media. People's mental, there's four key groups who are much, whose mental health is more is worse or more badly affected. So we know that women has mental health is more badly affected than men. Young people's much worse. People from more socially deprived backgrounds is much worse. And those individuals with pre-existing mental health problems are much worse as well. And what we can see here is clear evidence of, we look here, these young people in green, across the three waves, their mental health, their suicidal thoughts are much higher, much higher than the other groups. Women, it's not statistical increase here, or difference, but women are, report marginally higher levels of suicidal thoughts across the pandemic or the early stages of lockdown. We look at socioeconomic status, we see this very clear pattern again of those who are more socially disadvantaged, as is economic grouping, worse mental health in the context of suicidal thinking. People with pre-existing mental health problems, exactly the same pattern, much, much, but the, start, the differences are stark here. 20% versus 6% by way of three, comparing people with them without mental health problems. We also look at other groups, and this is at looking at, base, at wave one at the start of the pandemic, People who, whose employment status had changed even at that early stage of the pandemic, unsurprisingly, they were more suicidal. Those individuals who had children under the age of five, more suicidal than those who didn't. Those who told us that they weren't managing okay before the pandemic started in terms of finances, again, unsurprisingly, that their mental health in terms of suicidal ideation is similarly affected. So I mean, again, the start, that's a stark difference there from 7% to 22.5%. And you see the exact same pattern at, you see the exact same pattern at wave three. So it's just the same stable pattern of mental health um, impact of the lockdown. And then just a couple of other slides and then I'll, I'll be, I just think this is a really interesting one, which is looking at people's access to outside space. And what's really of note here is unsurprisingly, if you've got access, if you don't have access to outdoor space, your, your likelihood of having suicidal thoughts is greater. But what's stark though is this increase. So it seems to get much worse over time. 
So again, as we'll be tracking this, we haven't done the new analysis beyond May, but it'll be really interesting to see what happens out, especially as lockdown has been eased, and then obviously as it's been reintroduced over time. But again, another group of people who are particularly vulnerable. Loneliness as well, significantly higher levels of loneliness amongst young people, although they, they, they get slightly less lonely over time. But again, more markers of young people are, been, have been, are the one group I would say that before the pandemic began that we probably didn't anticipate being as effective. Well, I certainly didn't anticipate. I had anticipated the other groups, but I hadn't anticipated the, the, the strength of the effect on young people. And then this just, I like just a few other measures, same point with depressive symptoms, people who've got pre-existing mental health problems, unsurprisingly, they've, they've much more, um, th much more uh, or worse or more uh, depressive symptoms across the first three waves. And then defeat and entrapment, just as it comes to the end here, defeat and entrapment, we see exactly the same pattern. So people who've got a previous mental health condition, they feel much more defeated. They feel much more trapped. You see exactly the same if you look at social grouping. People who've been in a more socially, lower social economic grouping, worse mental health in terms of defeat and in terms of entrapment. But again, across the waves, these are stable, stable patterns. Okay, as I come up now to it's, uh, the end, I just want to tie it all together with such a whirlwind of, of some conclusions. So what I've tried to illustrate using lots of different sorts of research is that Basically, suicidal behavior is a complex phenomenon. Of course it is, multi-determined, multifactorial, but I think it's ultimately a psychological factor, phenomenon, which is affected by all these range of variables. And I just focused in on that second point there, on the utility of a theoretical model like mine to, to gauge your research and crucially to differentiate, help us differentiate between people who just think about suicide and go no further, and those who then make that transition from thinking to attempting suicide. But Chris, the third bullet point though, is the reason this is important is because that should help us think about how we intervene, how we target individuals and groups and at a societal level, so we can reduce the likelihood that people become suicidal in the first place, to so target the motivational phase, the middle bit of my model. But if you can't stop people being suicidal, you can also stop them hopefully making that transition from thinking to attempting suicide. So we talk about it as the intention, your suicidal intention to your suicidal behavior gap. What we're trying to do, we're trying to make that as wide as possible so that pe few, as few people as possible make that transition. And then the last bit, I just try to give you some glimmer, some insight into some of the more recent work we've been doing, looking at the mental health and well-being of people in the pandemic. But the concern in the, with the pandemic is, although there is no evidence yet, that suicide rates have increased, we have to be vigilant because there is signals like from suicidal thoughts data, which are suggesting that people um, can be vulnerable and are vulnerable. Okay, so that's me in, in a nutshell. So I'll, I'll, I'll end it there, but just, with, just one last line, which is what I hope I've done is try to challenge some of your views around why people become suicidal, but crucially, hopefully help you understand a bit more why so, sadly so many people think suicide for them may be the option. And that if we can all intervene and do our small bit to hopefully get those numbers down. Thank you. We've had a question, a couple of questions here about gun laws and whether strict gun laws uh, tend to reduce or whether countries such as the United States have higher um, prevalence. I wonder if that's something you could maybe comment on. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but so you can, so in the United States, the leading cause of death by suicide is by um, handguns, obviously. Not obviously, but it is, and that's certainly not the case. That's not the case in the UK. And actually, you can predict, you can statistically predict the suicide rates per, um, in, each state of, in each state of the United States from the number of guns owned in that state. So clear, it's a clear issue. It's a big issue, and I know colleagues working in the, in the U.S. are really trying to, because it's such a difficult one to tackle in the U.S. Because it's so, as we all know, it's so politicized. Um, and so, because the minute you try and restrict access, it it becomes this big issue. So what they try to do is increase the distance between an individual and their gun, and that's the sort of suicide prevention efforts are doing in the United States. But it's like the elephant in the room, though, because there's more people, more people 
by their own hand in the United States than are shot, or I mean, in terms of homicide. Okay, thank you. Um, possibly with a US theme still slightly. Um, another question, do greater levels of inequality in society lead to a greater likelihood of suicide attempts? Yep, um, inequality is a huge issue. I, I mean, uh, um, without a doubt, without a shadow, without a tweet, a few years ago we did the study even which looked at, um, it's, an, it's an index of inequality, obviously, it's a, um, which was not, we didn't ask, people's absolute income and we looked at their relative income right what they what they thought the relative income was was other people who lived in the same area across the UK and the and the and the stronger predictor of suicide suicidal behavior was the relative risk the relative disadvantage right so the relative inequality rather than absolute inequality now of course social disadvantage is if we could sort out social disadvantage we would go such such a distance to um, preventing suicide. And it's actually an absolute disgrace. So we live in a, a country, same in most Western countries, we have this huge gradient, this huge social class gradient. And that, and indeed it used to be some parts of the East End of Glasgow. Um, it used to mean the average age of people dying and a lot of that suicide is in your fifties compared to obviously people who live in Eastern Bartonshire or whatever it may be, it's much higher or they're, they're obviously seventies. So it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge issue which we need to be doing more about and, and making sure that, especially now in the pandemic, that we're not going to make that inequality even greater. Okay. And uh, obviously people in prison, um, uh, of, often there is a sign of inequality, are, pr are prison rates of suicide higher than the general population? You, you broke up there, Garrett. Sorry, say that again. Sorry, uh, Tony was asking whether suicide in prison is higher than in the general population. So, um, so it's yes and no for that. So, in some studies, so show yes. Um, again, it depends. If you, so, the issue. So, I would say overall yes, right? But the issue is you have to then take into consideration is the people who are in prison are bringing with them a whole host of risk factors anyway. So, pre-existing mental health problems and so on. And we know the people on remand. Or or and at early stages of sentencing are increased risk, so they're they're higher at higher risk than other groups, other prisoners. Okay, and um, we've got several questions on, on cortisol, which, which I've yeah. mentioned. Um, so, for example, um, the effects of cortisol on the body depend not only on the circulating concentration in the blood, but also on the density of the cortisol receptors. Do these differ between people of uh, differing suicide risk? <laughs> what a very, very specific question. Can I find it here so I can under... So where is that question? Is that... So that's the third from the bottom. Uh, third from the bottom. Um, can't... No, not that one. Um, can't see that. Oh, do, the effects of course on the body depend not only on the circulating cause, but also on density. Uh, I don't think we know enough actually about whether it's a it's a difference in receptors or on um, on actually the uh, where are the concentration in the body. So that's a that's a good question. I don't think we know the answer to that question because um, so the cortisol and suicide literature is is really is a, such a complicated literature. A few years ago, we published a meta analysis, and so to complicate matters further, there's also an age effect. So age moderates the relationship. So actually. If you just say on average people under the age of 40, you see this positive relationship that actually people who attempt suicide have higher cortisol. Then over 40, you see the reverse. You see then similar to what I talked about in the study, you see the flattened response. And what we think is going on there is obviously the body is in the younger people, the body is just still responding to being repeatedly stressed, but it's still working okay. And then obviously over time then the dysregulation happens even so that will complicate even further looking at the dance of the issue but great question okay, um leading on to the fastening um rossman's asking uh can the can the courses of a curve um <clears throat> from uh, multiple stress events be modified and if it can be modified how would you do that that's a great question as well um so the really interesting thing is so i, I didn't present these data but if we look at if we look at the people who attempted suicide and we divided those into 
what we described as historical and, and more recent. So people who actually had attempted suicide more than a year ago versus those more recently. Most of that, most of the flattening is in that more recent group in the past 12 months. So that, so we don't know, so we, so, uh, we don't know what happened to what we describe as a historical group. Did they get treatment or whatever? But their cortisol levels, we look aggregate the data, their cortisol levels ha are, have improved. Now, they don't improve to the level of the control individuals or even the ideation. They're closer to the ideation group. Now, so, but, but the answer, your, the other part of your question, though, is that, so not in the suicide literature, but there has been some work which has looked at um, mindfulness. Can, can, does mindfulness and other sort of stress reduction interventions, does it alleviate or does it improve levels of cortisol? And there is some evidence that may do. So I think that we're engaged in this and really looking at this, uh, especially in a sample like people with suicidal histories, but that's something we are actively looking at, trying to do, develop some, or trying to secure funding for some interventions-based work to try and tackle that question. Okay, and um, from, from some, I guess also from medical background, do people taking corticosteroids for treatment of illnesses have a higher risk of suicide? Uh, and they're excluding those who develop steroid psychosis. Um, I don't know directly um, the answer to that question, but my, my, my hunch is that, so it, it depends what you're taking the corticosteroid that, for example, people with chronic pain or at increased risk of suicidal behavior. So, so we'd have to be, we'd have to try and disentangle that relationship between, from the medication relationship. So we do work on, we do, we do work on pain, uh, the physical pain tolerance I mentioned earlier. Um, so we just, so we, um, so, I, so, we, so we don't know for certain, it would be my short answer. Okay, uh, on the subject of pain leading in, what do you think about end of life suicide? Is it the same or do you, do you see it differently? <laughs> I mean, I see it, I mean, in terms of my model of suicide, it's, it's the same. I think the processes are the same, but the individual um, conceptualizing the end of life. And I suppose for me, the, the tricky, well, it's just, it's such a difficult topic um, because if, so if we've lost, I come across so many people who, who, who were acutely suicidal and just for whatever whoever's out there that are still alive after taking really medically serious suicide attempts, who at the time thought that they would that they were better off dead, are so pleased they're alive, right? So you have to be careful that how, so in terms of end of life, it's just a tricky, that's a question of that issue. So my view is that, I suppose I'm a member of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. So I would do whatever I can to help people. Um, hopefully not end their life but I understand I mean it's a it's a difficult issue and um and I suppose that's probably my way of responding to that question okay uh from Pat um might chronic stress not be more important in affecting suicide risk than the acute stress that you simulated in the mast test so chronic rather than acute well so I'm not so I'm not making a more important. I, so the point of the mass test is it's is also, it's also trying in the laboratory, try and disentangle effectively these relationships. And so without a shadow of a doubt, I, I mean, chronic stress, I mean, is, is damaging. Of course it is for, I mean, it's, it's no, that's no surprise, but I think it was different for everybody. So, for, so some people it's chronic stress, chronic stress, chronic stress. And then sadly, a suicide attempt for others it's people who, and there's an acute stressor which leads to suicide attempts. So I don't think saying which is more or less important in that context. Stress in all its manifestations is part of the puzzle. But remember, that's not the one, that's, there's never one explanation for suicide. Okay. Um, in, in terms of what leads to stress, we've had a, a couple of questions here uh, on perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the adult experience of perfectionism, burdensomeness and entrapment might be linked to early relational life experiences um, or do you think that perfection, perfectionism leads to greater internal entrapments? Okay so there's two questions there so the first the development of perfectionism so perhaps unsurprisingly but there have there have been very few proper developmental longitudinal developmental studies looking at 
the emergence of perfectionism. But what there have been done suggests that um, early, so invalidating experiences in childhood, inconsistent, inconsistent parenting experiences, trauma, the um, parents or caregivers as, who, as models of social perfectionism all contribute to your own perfectionism. But like any other personality or individual differences factor, there are determining factors and there's no inevitability. And remember, perfectionism in and of itself is not a bad thing. It only becomes, it's like the good example of the diathesis stress relationship, it only becomes problematic, problematic in the presence of stress. Does, so I, in terms of the relationship between perfectionism and entrapment, data to show that, um, that without a doubt, so I think the reason perfectionism, hopefully I'm, I'm saying I'm unstable, unstable, hopefully I'm okay, um, the perfectionism is, it, perfectionism, social perfectionism in particular, which I mentioned, increases your, I hypothesize, increases your sensitivity to defeat and loss and so on. So you've got this situation in which um, basically, I, th I, I think of social perfectionism as having a psychological thin skin. And that, so, so when, when negative social things happen, loss, all those really things we all experience, it's somebody who's high in social perfectionism, that's much more likely to get in. So that's much more likely then to start the pathway from defeat then to entrapment. So yes is, a, is the short answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple of questions here about interventions. One, um, unfortunately, one of our audience lost two members of their family to suicide. Another's attempted, two others have had ideation and currently receiving support. Uh, terrified of it happening again, what support would you recommend? Uh, and uh, related to that, um, can you say something about the nature of interventions that can make an impact on the behaviour gap? I'm just so where's that for that, for that previous question because it's difficult to uh, for the fourth from the sorry third from the bottom. So I don't know if I'm, fourth from the bottom. Sorry, third, third from the bottom. Sorry. Third from the bottom. Uh, okay, so I've lost two immediate family members to suicide. And Susan, yeah, I am terrified this happened again. I've had it. Um, I mean that's a real. I mean I really. Um, feel your anxiety and uh, as someone who's lost, I under, it, it is a real concern. I suppose that, what, there, there's no easy, there's no easy, there's no one simple answer, I suppose is what I'm trying to say, except remember that the, that the vulnerability to suicide is there's all these multiple factors and that, um, and it's really maybe keeping open, if, so, if somebody has a, pre-existing mental health problem, are they getting the help and support they require? Are we keeping options open for them in terms of getting talking support, I mean, psychological support and so on? And, and obviously having this open relationship with your GP or, or whoever it may be. But I just think communication is key. But, and, um, and remember that although statistic, the statistical risk is high, and I know you, you, what you've described obviously is very close to home um, and is it, it's not inevitable. So um, hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Um, related to factors, um, do alcohol and drugs contribute from ideation mm -hmm. to action? Yeah, so we, without a doubt, without a doubt, the reason they're not in the model, they're a more generic issue one needs to deal with. So of course, we, so we published the paper Last year, year before, on what we described as the alcohol, alcohol related volitional factors effectively. And they're looking at their cognition. So, definitely, we know that alcohol obviously is a facilitator, it, it's, it, but it increases your risk because it increases the likelihood that you act impulsively. It, inc it increases your risk because it makes you perhaps less fearful about dying. And the same with drugs. And then the other thing with alcohol and drugs is. Anything which interferes with basic homeostasis, drugs interfere, interfere with sleeping, for example, and relationships. So sleeping, I know relationships is not a homeostatic function, but sleeping is, and sleeping, anything then which interferes with problem solving increases your likelihood. Okay. Um, I've just seen some smart, smart comment there about the Michael Palin. Yes, I've had that s s several times. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, last, last couple of questions there. Uh, is, is there an explanation, or what is the explanation, if you know it, for the sex difference in Very the... Very you broke up there, sorry. What, what's the explanation for the sex difference in suicidal thoughts, thoughts and suicidal uh, incidents? So, surprisingly, um, despite the fact that three quarters of all suicides are by men, and in every country in the world now men outnumber women, you know, they're, they're, the gender differences are different so there's, there's three to one gender difference in traditional Western countries, much, much smaller, closer to one on one in Asia. Um, and so part of the, so the short answer is we don't know for certain, but part of it is as follows. One is that men tend to use more lethal methods of suicide. And so sadly then the case fatality rate, the likelihood that that method will end in death is greater in men. So that I think is probably the largest explanatory factor and then there is things like help seeking is that men are less likely to seek help earlier and that is true that's not just a stereotypical myth um so there's something around that there's something around whole, what about masculinity and how we manage that and the challenges of of being a man the, the changing um role of a male in modern society i think is is difficult um whereas the female role has become better defined which which is fantastic. I think that the male role is not as well defined anymore. And that the, the issue then about obviously reason now, for example, the biggest, when I started in this field, the biggest risk group were people in their 20s, men in their 20s. That was in, in the 1990s. And I'm that risk group because I just got older, obviously, with the risk group. And now the largest risk group in the UK is middle aged men. And that is also, with, um, if, so you think that men tend to have fewer emotional supports in their life, right? Which are, so often it's invested in a partner. And then when, the, when those relationships break down for many in midlife, because um, it's, it's almost 50% now of all marriages in the UK and in divorce um, of first marriages, um, that, that, that their men are much more isolated and so emotionally disconnected. So there's lots going on there, but I think the largest one I think is of those first two, is method, method and not seeking help earlier, early enough. If I'm throwing a question on my own, um, you've mentioned Asia there, and I think at the beginning of your talk, you talked about mental health being a factor in the Western world. Are there significant differences and does your model apply uh, globally or do you think it is limited to the Western world? No, no, the model, the model does apply. So I, again, I deliberately do not have mental health problems in the model. Um, because I don't think mental health problems are part of the background to understand suicide risk. But so, so there's, um, there's some, so I, without a shadow of a doubt, suicide usually happens in the context of mental health problems. However, if you look, if you look in Asia, so it's, a, so, and some people estimate upwards of 90% of all suicides, uh, there's a mental health problem in, in the, in the mix. But if you look in Western, in Asian countries, it can be about 40 or 50%. Now, and that, and, and that is partly, some people argue that's just because perhaps the cultural difference is that the mental health problem is still, still present, but obviously it's not diagnosed. I don't think it's that. I think it's obviously, because obviously psychiatric illnesses are constructions of symptoms that we interpret and, 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 and there's real pain, of course, but influences. So, so, so my model comes from, because I think what's at the heart of it is entrapment. That sense of being trapped and what differs is the sense of entrapment is different in different contexts. So we, people have applied the model, for example, in, in India, in Africa, and um, in, 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 in obviously in other Western countries as well, for example, and these still, you still see these, still the common, these common factors that are the psychological processes, I think, are universal. Okay, and if I, I bring it to close with a final question, um, and I think we should exclude lemmings from the answer to this, are humans the only animals that commit suicide? And if so, do you have any idea why? So, um, so we think that we are the only species that um, end their own life. And um, but I think that's because the argument is you have to have whatever theory, I know obviously some other primates can have theory of mind, but I just, so we, we have no evidence yet that, that chimps, for example, 
our end, and they would be our most likely, um, I think, to see it. And there's no, we have no evidence yet of the, of suicides, convincing evidence. People have written papers saying others do. I just don't find any of this evidence convincing. And I think it's to do with obviously that. So if you think about the key drivers is mental pain, right? And feeling a burden and others and all these drivers. I just don't know if all other primates have that capacity. It might be wrong, but that will be my answer to it. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's been a, a wonderful talk from you. And you've been very patient with, with all these questions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone would have enjoyed it. I just wish uh, you could hear the applause that no doubt is uh, <laughs> if wanted. It's just the unfortunate way that these uh, Zoom talks go. But thank you very much for a very, very stimulating, very interesting lecture. Um, and it was a pleasure hearing from you. Thank you very much, Karen. I really enjoyed it and hopefully um, people find it helpful. But just the last thing before we go is it's really important. Self-care is so, so important. It's a really difficult topic we've all been listening to tonight. And so please, if you are concerned about yourself or others, please reach out. It's, um, ask, if you're worried about somebody, please ask them whether they're thinking of ending their life. That does not plant the idea in their head. It could get them the help that they require. And if you're worried about yourself, please speak to your GP or Samaritans or other, other organizations out there. So please, please look after yourself. So, so important.